Um, we'll just start right in, because uh, I wanted to ask you, I read a quote from you uh, the other day in which you said that the principles of humanitarian assistance or the principles of, of humanitarianism are under pressure right now um, around the world, but including in the US. What did you mean? What were you referring to? Well, um, the, um, the principles of humanitarianism, what are the principles of humanitarianism? I, I guess that's you know a, a good starting point, um, and, um, and 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 in in life, um, you know, we all have principles, and then we spend most of our time trying to, you know, tack as close to them as possible. Not always perfectly, but but um, but as well as we can. So the pr the principles of humanitarianism. As you know, as uh, articulated by the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, humanitarian experts, um, uh, um, humanitarian organizations, involve uh, the concept of impartiality, the notion that we should provide aid uh, without discrimination based on need, um, the principle of um, of neutrality, that the those who are involved in the delivery of aid should should be providing it uh, without taking sides in, in conflicts. Uh, the principle of uh, independence, that those who are aid deliverers um, should not be associated with parties of the, to the conflict. And to me, the most critical principle, perhaps, the principle of humanity. And what is the principle of humanity? Uh, it's the principle that my daughter, who I care about deeply, um, you know, has no greater inherent worth than uh, a young woman thousands of miles away uh, whom I don't know. Um, that, that when you're in this business, um, uh, on some level, we are, not on some level, fundamentally we are all of, have the same inherent worth and we all are worthy of the world's support and assistance. And I think it, those kinds of principles are under stress when, <sighs> Um, in the United States, uh, a new administration uh, proposes a 30% cut uh, in international um, humanitarian assistance, which, um, you know, which would have significant, substantial, dramatic impacts on, um, on uh, the ability of vulnerable, com vulnerable communities around the world to get by. Um, uh, humanitarian assistance to people who are involved in in crises. Uh, they are they are a threat when uh, a new administration, um, uh, you know, imposes um, uh, uh, a a ban, a, the the, the so-called Muslim ban, but in addition imposes a suspension of refugee admissions, U.S. refugee admissions, um, uh, for a four-month period only. Uh, to end that four-month period with the imposition of, of unreasonable uh, restrictions on the refugee admissions process such that we are likely to have the lowest number of refugees admitted into the United States um, you know, in, in our generation. Um, and, and in circumstances where the articulated justifications for these um, uh, security processes that are limiting uh, uh, refugee admissions are without a basis in fact. Um, they, are, they, are a, they are a threat um, when um, uh, the United States is no longer um, playing to the extent that we should be playing um, a, a leadership role in, um, our, in, in promoting uh, collective responses to international humanitarian crises when uh, uh, leaders in Europe articulate nasty, um, uh, you know, uh, prejudiced, uh, xenophobic nonsense and the, and, and the American president is silent about those issues. Those are all reasons why um, uh, we need to be very concerned about, um, uh, about uh, uh, you know, sustaining uh, values and principles that really, you know, reflect the best, uh, I, I believe, of American life. And principles like that, if I remember correctly, were codified in 
in an agreement that was reached during the George W. Bush administration. Yeah, the uh, in, in implicit in what you've just said is is that you would never hold um, hold a refugee hostage uh, to a political goal that you have. And I think about I think about the president's decision. Um, it, it, to, to hold back aid to the UN agency that, that takes, helps refugees, Palestinian refugees, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Turkey, in the Gaza, the West Bank. Um, that seems in clear violation of that. What has become of that concept? Is he doing it? Is, uh, will this actually happen? Well, you read um, you read the letter <laughs> that that, that uh, or I think oh. um, that 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 we issued. Yes, it, it, in fact. Um, um, the um, you know several several weeks ago, um, the the administration uh, the president decided that we would withhold the United States of America would withhold its contributions uh, or something like I believe sixty million sixty or sixty five million of its contributions of its, of its its expected contributions to the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East uh, the body that was established. Um, you know, to um, to uh, basically take care of the Palest Palestinian population, uh, um, and um, and uh, and and that decision was explicitly uh, was explicitly um, justified uh, on 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 the basis of the administration's uh, unhappiness with um, the. The, pos the positions of the Palestinian political leadership. And that was very troubling, that, extremely troubling uh, to, to me, to my organization, and to um, many other organizations. So we organized a letter to the administration in which we pointed out that, um, that the Bush administration, uh, as you mentioned, Jane, uh, you know, uh, signed on to something called the Good Humanitarian Donorship Principles, um, uh, in which governments of the world, uh, you know, basically uh, stood for the proposition that you provide aid to civilians in need um, without reference to the politics of, of and the positions of political leaders. So this decision by the Trump administration was such a marked departure to those principles. Now, you know, don't get don't get me wrong. The United States uh, commit, uh, um, application of those principles over time has been imperfect. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, it, it, but no administration that I can remember uh, articulated ever publicly articulated the notion that we were going to disregard them. In fact, it was Ronald Reagan, uh, in the context of the Ethiopian famine, who said, um, a hungry child knows no politics. So, and, and where, where is this issue now? Well, the, the money has been withheld. And whether or not um, the administration uh, will provide the funds is, is, is uncertain and very troubling. So what are conditions in Gaza uh, in any event, I mean, without this, this decision, these are folks who are being very squeezed by, by politics all around. Well, yeah, by all by all indications, um, uh, the conditions in in Gaza are, are you know, very dismal. Um, there are you know very few uh, job opportunities. Um, there are restrictions on access. Um, the you know it is a, it is in a miserable state, and so. The idea that you know that th these cuts will affect um, uh, access to schools for kids, access to health care, you know, they're, they're, they they are very they are very disconcerting and very troubling. Yeah. I'm going to take you to another part of the world, and that's to sure. to the Rohingya mm -hmm. uh, in uh, to Myanmar to Burma. Um, here's a situation where Secretary Tillerson has said the world uh, will not should not stand by. Um, I think we've heard uh, uh, Vice President Pence has, has uh, spoken to the issue, as has Nikki Haley. What is our strategy there? I know Congress has cut back some uh, assistance to the military there, but what is, what is our strategy overall with, with respect to the Rohingya? Well, let me, let me answer your question, and then I'm, uh, 
very very succinctly, and then I'll I'll walk back to this this crisis because I think it's worth uh, talking a little bit about the magnitude of, right. of what is happening. And you've just been there. I, I was there in September, um, and uh, we were one of the first organizations on the ground uh, looking at the situation. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that if right. I if I might. But um, uh, the, 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 the problem is there really isn't a strategy, and, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, notwithstanding some very uh, strong statements by admi senior administration officials, mm -hmm. which I think are welcome, um, you know, this is what, what, what has happened in this part of the world, in Burma, in Western Burma, there was a, um, there, there, there is a population of, um, uh, of a Muslim population in Western Burma. Uh, Muslim population is probably less than 5% of, of Burma. Um, and this is a, 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 a population that's been in the country um, for centuries. Um, and uh, they were, in a matter of weeks, they were, in a matter of weeks, um, this is a population that was um, largely just driven out of the country. More than 650,000 people um, between, I would say, the end of August and probably October, November, um, uh, maybe as late as December, uh, were, were, were driven out of the country. And the only way you can drive 650,000 people out of a country that they don't want to leave so quickly is by uh, by really committing unspeakable acts, and the the, the, the Burmese military um, would go into villages and um, and um, and um, uh, firebomb villages with incendiary devices, and also uh, shoot people or shoot at people um, uh, as they were fleeing uh, Medsan's frontier. Uh, estimated that um, uh, upwards of 6,700 people were probably killed uh, in in this uh, in this forced exodus, um, and it's based on a, a, a sort of the the, uh, the this army action by Burma is based, and they were all pushed into Bangladesh, one of the most densely populated countries on earth. And, and one of the poorest. And one of the poorest. And, 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 and ironically enough, a country that has made great strides on issues like disaster uh, uh, prevention. Um, and, um, uh, but so they're in this, in this densely populated area south of Cox's Bazar, across the border from, from Burma, and, um, and living in really unspeakable uh, uh, circumstances. Um, and... Um, uh, and, and it's all, the, 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 the action is based on a sort of a, a Burmese nationalist myth that these, are, that, the, that these are foreigners, that these are people who really are Bengali, who, who should be in Bangladesh. And um, of course, um, uh, that's nonsense. And, um, but, it, it, but, but, but the military and the authorities in, in Burma have whipped up this nationalist sentiment and so the situation is very, very difficult. Very, and, and, um, and so the, the administration was slow to react. Um, uh, I remember there was testimony on Capitol Hill where a, an administration official, was, was a senior administration was testifying and he, they, <laughs> the members of Congress were saying, is this ethnic, ethnic cleansing? And they couldn't get the administration official to acknowledge the ethnic cleansing, the most they could get him to say was, "This was a cauldron of complexity." And when, um, you know, when an official says that, he's sort of sending a signal to the rest of the world that this is not an issue that we're prepared to take a tough stand on. Well, you know, a number of organizations have sort of br brought this, these terrible atrocities to light. And the administration, some administration officials have responded. I, I think, you know, the, the uh, UN Ambassador Nikki Haley made very, very strong statements. She has somebody, uh, uh, an ambassador working for her, um, uh, 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 Ambassador Kelly Curry, who's been very strong on these issues. Secretary Tillerson has made some strong statements. Secretary Mattis has made strong statements. The problem is the president has said nothing on this issue. The president of the United States has said nothing uh, on, on an issue that re reflects, you know, one of the greatest crimes, if not the greatest crime, well, one of the greatest crimes of our generation. And, and if the, the president's silence is very significant in this kind of situation, members of Congress have been very involved, but there is not, there's not a strategy in answer to your question. 
Um, and there's not a, an, an effort, an international effort, l which would, under other circumstances, be led by the United States of America to rally the world, to put pressure on the regime in Burma, and, uh, to, pr and to, to, to fully fund um, the needs of the refugees in, in Bangladesh. So that's a kind of a long-winded uh, answer to your very simple question, but I figured we have an hour, so I'm just, you know. <laughs> well, th there's been a move. Uh, obviously, Bangladesh, Bangladesh can't handle this influx uh, as well, and they've and they've pressed to repatriate uh, the Rohingya back in Burma. Uh, I think the UN has stepped in and said that. The, the country is not ready for that. I mean, they'd come back to exactly the same conditions except their villages have been burned to the ground. Um, now, what I've been told is that, that the Burmese have, have set up uh, kind of camps for their return that, that are reminiscent of concentration camps. Is that correct? And what does, if, if well, first tell me if it's correct, because my follow-on question will... Well, the uh, reporting that I've seen, and this is, this is um, so several weeks ago, was that there were... Um, uh, 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 kind of stations that were established, a couple of stations that, that were going to be or had been established um, in Burma for returnees. But I frankly don't know how that issue has, has developed. But what we've said about that is, you know, yeah, uh, uh, back, I believe, in November, um, the, the, the government of Burma and the government of Bangladesh reached an agreement on repatriation. Uh, in principle, and they said that they would work out modalities. And uh, several weeks ago, they said, well, we've worked out modalities and we're ready to begin. But, but, um, but nothing is, I mean, there's, there's no reason for any Rohingya who's in Bangladesh to have any degree of confidence right. about return to Burma. First of all, nothing's changed. Nothing's right. changed. And the, the, the villages, many of the, most of the, vill the villages that they've left have been wiped out. And, um, you know, and the, the, conver the discussion about um, uh, this, is, this is a population who over many decades have progressively had their, um, uh, their rights withdrawn. In other words, their situation, uh, you know, 10 years ago was better than it is today, and their situation 20 years ago was better than it was 10 years ago, right? And so, um, so... Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kofi Annan uh, led a commission uh, with the, in cooperation with um, the government of Burma uh, to, uh, you know, to look at the situation in this, this area of Western Burma called Rakhine State. And among the conclusions of this commission's report was that, that the, the government needed to establish a pathway uh, for citizenship for this population. Um, but there's no indication. I mean, it's just something surreal about you know talking about return, talking about you know a pathway to citizenship, talking about rights in the wake of one of the most grotesque um, you know a a actions against the population that we've seen in such a long time. So the short answer is there there, there there's going to have to be you know some fundamental shifts. In, in, um, in, in guarantees for return, uh, and I would even say a presence of the international community in Rakhine State uh, and, and before we could even begin uh, to talk about any serious process what of return. What would that presence look like? Would it be, uh, you're not thinking in terms of peacekeepers, or you I are? would love to see peacekeepers in Rakhine State. It, you know, how politically viable is that? I, I don't know. I mean, I wrote an op-ed piece in the, the Washington Post, and 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 several of, uh, and I spoke to a lot of uh, friends about it, and I, um, and I was tempted to, uh, you know, not uh, call for a pe peacekeeping, uh, uh, f uh, a peacekeeping a presence uh, in Rakhine State. I ended up calling for a presence in Rak an international mm -hmm. presence in Rakhine State. But yeah, in a situation like that, that's the classic situ That's the classic example of of a situation where even a, what's called a traditional peacekeeping uh, force would be completely appropriate. Because if the government of Burma says, "Yeah, they can come back, and we're not going to do anything bad uh, 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 to them," you don't put in a you you, you don't put in a necessarily a peacekeeping force. To um, you know, to, uh, to to do to do to do battle with the government of Burma, you put a peacekeeping force in, troops in, 
basically to monitor and to, and to be the eyes and ears of the international community and to report on situations that seem to violate uh, understandings. That's what, a, that's what a peacekeeping force could do. Not that you wouldn't give it any capability to, to protect civilians, you would, but it would fundamentally, I think, uh, 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 you know, a peacekeeping force would be, it would be a great idea, but nobody has suggested it. The, that's the, there's such a, a lack of imagination, a lack of, of, of initiative in the international conversation about this issue that it's disheartening. Now, don't get me wrong, you should never feel disheartened. I mean, I wouldn't be the president of Refugees International if I thought these were, you know, that these were, uh, uh, you know, uh, causes uh, that that were completely hopeless. I think there's always the opportunity for progress, but we have to push governments to do more. I'm struck by how hard the genocide case is when you think about it. I mean, we, I think we all feel that never again is is something we utter uh, truthfully and passionately, and yet. There was Bosnia. Yes, there was Rwanda. Yes, Kosovo. Uh, we reacted more quickly. Yes, uh, Burma. And um, I'm struck that you know, leader after leader in the case of, of Rwanda, it happened so fast, um, was was part of the problem. But there wasn't in place a consensus that you act and you act in the following way. I mean, I, I don't think President Carter felt that the public was uh, prepared. Uh, we knew Congress wasn't prepared, and that was that was clear. Um, I remember when George W. Bush ran, he said uh, Rwanda and Kosovo are not in our interest. Come in, so there was a sense that it could be it it, it could be specific to a geography, uh, as opposed to the clear principle that genocide is genocide is genocide, and a certain set of actions. So I, I'm I'm saying all this to to ask you whether. We actually need a protocol in place, um, an understanding of what does it mean when you say never again, what are states obligated to do, um, and so that the sort of consensus is reached in advance and you're not worried about something happening in a matter of weeks. Or is such a thing in place? It's a great and a hard question. Um, let me answer it um, at the what I would call the 5,000 foot level, and then the 30,000 foot level. I'll start at the, mm -hmm. at the, at the you know, at the 5,000 foot level. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what uh, I think in many respects, not not specific to genocide, but but specific to um, to to uh, you know, um, um, ethnic cleansing, genocide, massive abuses. Um, that's what the whole responsibility to protect movement was about yeah. um it, it in, in that you know this was uh, this was a, a an effort after after um Srebrenica right the the massacre of muslims in that in that in that bosnian town after rwanda um in 1994 uh the you know the genocide against um uh, uh again the uh, against uh, against the tutsi community um um um, there was soul searching in the international community and um, in the international community among governments of the world among international organizations um, and the and um, this is when Kofi Annan was secretary general Kofi, yeah. Kofi Annan was secretary general and there were reports a report written on Srebrenica a report written on Rwanda so so the secretary general supported uh, the establishment of uh, of, uh, of uh, the international commission on intervention and state sovereignty a Canadian sponsored initiative designed to look at these principles and look at the circumstances in which um, uh, governments of the world maybe should respond. And um, it was chaired by Gareth Evans, the former Australian foreign minister, and Mohamed Sanoun. Um, and and the, the conclusion of this, uh, of this effort was that, well, there were several conclusions that you need to work on prevention, you need to work on, on, on post-conflict um, re reconstruction and recovery. But one critical conclusion in this effort was in circumstances, and it was very similar to kind of a just war uh, theory, uh, in circumstances where governments are unwilling and, uh, or unable, either unwilling or unable uh, to protect their populations from mass violence, um, the international community could step in and respond. Um, that sovereignty 
didn't simply mean uh, if you were the sovereign that this was your territory and nobody could come into it, but, so, but the concept here was sovereignty as responsibility. And if you failed in that responsibility, um, the world had obligations. And then, um, and then, and then, in um, uh, then this was a, this was endorsed um, uh, by um, member governments of the General Assembly and the Security Council. I won't get into all the details. I I teach this issue, so I won't take the normal time that I. But it was endorsed by in principle by the Security Council and by the General Assembly, um, and. Um, uh, or, or by the General Assembly. Uh, the Security Council has, inv has invoked the principle as well. Um, and, um, and, uh, um, uh, and, 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 but, but, but in application, it's been problematic. Um, uh, there have been challenges. Uh, it was invoked in the, in, the, in the context of the Libya intervention, the, uh, the intervention in, in, in Libya. Um, and, um, um, and and the, 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 the Libya intervention raises a number of different questions, which I think are critical and, and, um, and um, you know, that, the, that governments of the world need to grapple with. Number one, does responsibility to protect create an obligation to protect? Or is it a discretionary kind of thing? In other words, um, you know, it, 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 when the, these massive crimes are taking place, do governments have an obligation to act, and the R two P concept doesn't seem to doesn't seem to suggest that, that it's not clear on that. Um, secondly, and I think the more profound question is, um, uh, does um, uh, you know the Russians complain that 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 you know that the that the Libya intervention was really for much more um, that you know, trying to get rid of Gaddafi and that the presence was was you know it, it was it was more than simply to save lives it was regime change regime change yeah. right but actually the, uh, it, the that objection raises an interesting issue which is you know can you do a resp uh, that kind of an action as a sort of an in and out operation I think the answer to that question is no. I don't, in other words, I think if you're prepared to step in and save lives, you also, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. I think you have to sustain your engagement. There has to be some sort of sustained engagement. Otherwise, you walk, you, 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 you save lives, you withdraw, and the situation becomes a conflagration again. So I think those are tough questions around this doctrine. But, but now to move to 30,000 feet, you know, I think that, that that um, those in 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 those individuals in governments outside of governments, um, uh, in the advocacy community, who who care about the humanitarian uh, issues, the, the the humanitarian dimensions of these issues, um, are in a continual, you know, they're in a con we're in a continu there's a continual conflict tension between that, between those sentiments and those perspectives and the realities of geopolitics. And, um, and, and you, can't, you can't wish away the realities of geopolitics, they're there. And so governments are gonna pursue their interests. And sometimes their interests mean they're gonna respond to a certain situation and other times their interests mean they, they won't and they'll, they'll let the suffering continue. So, so, so the work of, of those of us, the, of those who feel that these values need to be injected into foreign policy decision making is the, the you know the, 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 we have our work cut out for us so what does the, what does the genocide convention date back to i can't remember it's a long time but i can't remember the date of it um, um, uh, I, I don't know the exact okay, date of the we'll, we'll I don't know it. the exact date of the genocide. We'll get it. Okay. Talk just really quickly before we leave um, uh, Myanmar as a case study. Talk sure. talk a little bit about the response of of the neighborhood. You know, of Thailand, of Malaysia, of Indonesia. Uh, what what kind of response has there been closer to closer to the the source of the of the conflagration? Um, the uh, it's a it's a great question. Um, I, I think um, uh, you know m Muslim governments uh, in in the region have expressed you know strong concern. Government of Bangladesh, the government of Indonesia, um, um, but um, but um, but those expressions of concern, um, and they've been not trivial, um, have not 
um, you know, th th this issue is not the highest priority of the, for those governments. So they have not played a determining role in the, um, um, you know, in, in the public discussion about these issues. The China, you know, the other, the other concern here is the role of China. And um, there are many in, um, you know, the, the, um, in our government, in the Department of State, who are, you know, kind of making, uh, who have made the case that uh, given uh, Chinese influence in the region, uh, given the importance of, um, of responding to Chinese uh, influence in the region, that the United States has an, a critical interest in engaging the regime uh, 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 in Burma, and therefore should, you know, be more uh, careful and cautious uh, about uh, about um, uh, you know breaking relations with um, the government of Burma. The answer to that, from my perspective, is that you know the United States government should be. Uh, <laughs> should be working much harder to engage the Chinese on these issues. And, um, uh, um, and, and we haven't been. Let me take you, um, take you to Syria, because your the conversation about responsibility to protect reminds me that, uh, let's focus on the displaced, the internally displaced, because of course, the legal unit that's supposed to be responsible for their protection is the Assad government. In the, in the case of the internally displaced, as opposed to the refugees, um, obviously um, that that's not a source of security for them. Um, talk a little bit about the situation right now. We've got as this UN calling for the Security Council calling for a ceasefire. The Assad government is pummeling uh, civilians and and the hospitals that would serve them and in Ghouta. Um, the Turks are coming over uh, and uh, you know, invaded over the border to go after the Kurds. Um, what's the state of play? Well, you've just described it. <laughs> it's no better than that. It's, it's no better than that. There are, um, you know, there are um, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the Ghouta area who are in uh, you know, severe, um, uh, uh, um, you know, who require humanitarian uh, aid. Um, the ceasefire has, uh, um, you know, uh, Putin made some statements today, um, which, um, uh, which um, uh, my organization welcomed, but also m m made very clear did not go far enough uh, um, in terms of a sustained ceasefire. Um, the, um, there, are, there are three million people in Syria who are now in uh, humanitarian need. You're right. The, the the numbers of this internally displaced. There are many millions who are internally displaced, in addition to something like five or six million refugees in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and there are and, and Syria has become a, a, an area for for, uh, for proxy combat uh, among governments in the region. Um, uh, you know, I. Um, it's hard to it's hard to try to articulate what a way forward um, would look like uh, for the international community, especially given the decision of this administration and the former administration not really to 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 play a significant role in trying to um, uh, you know influence and impact the situation on the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and barrel bombs are being used. Are the Russians also? Um, bombing in in uh, Guja, or, or are they providing air cover? What role are they playing right now? Um, um, I don't know. The reason I've stopped and asked is that. Well, let me let me note something else, and that is that there are reports that some people are having symptoms that are consistent with yeah. being uh, exposed to to chlorine. It's chlorine gas, yeah, a absolutely, and um, and. Um, the um, it, we've reported on that, and um, it, it, it what it's it, it is a it, it you know we think those reports are credible. Right, right. So there may actually be war crimes involved Absolutely, right now yeah. today. You made well, reference. Yeah, I, think, I think there are war crimes going on in Syria continually right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And and you made reference to to the conflict spreading in essence. I mean, here you've got you've got Iran, 
you've got the Assad government, you've got the Russian government, you've got Turkey. We're, we've got 2,000 folks there. Uh, we don't have a, a large presence. Um, and, and recently, this Iranian drone went uh, over yeah. into Israel, and Israel shot it down, and the, there was a back and forth. What is the risk of expansion? Um, I think the risk of expansion is considerable. Um, I think um, the... Um, the, um, the you know the 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 action the the potential of I think the potential of conflict between Israel and Iran is real, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and uh, and and what gives me again reason for concern is that I don't see in a situation like this, you know, the, the one would normally expect that the United States would be playing at the very at the very at the most senior level. An effort to, um, uh, you know, to uh, um, engage the parties, which we don't seem to be doing right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the president has, I think, correctly said that Russia has to be part of any solution there. That you have to have Russia on side, um, and that therefore we need a good relationship with Russia. He has a good relationship with Putin. Is there any evidence or suggestion that he's used that that uh, that relationship to improve the situation in Syria? Now everyone appreciates we're getting a little bit beyond my role, but that's fine. I'm happy. I mean, as a, as the You're president of refugees guy. of Refugees International, yeah. I mean, look, you can have a you can have a good relationship with anyone as long as you don't contest what they're doing in the world. I mean, you you know if. If and and but but if you know Russia is taking actions in the United States, in Syria, in Ukraine that are in very stark uh, conflict with American interests, and if you don't respond, if you don't take firm action against those measures, then it's pretty easy to have a good relationship. Um, um, and you know. Um, uh, but I don't think that serves the interests of world peace. I don't think it serves um, American interests. And I, so I think that, that I, it's, so the short answer to your question is I don't, see, I don't believe there's much evidence that the president's good relationship with Putin is resulting in, um, in, in, in uh, geopolitical or humanitarian gains uh, for the United States uh, or for the world. I also don't know. Has any have you seen any evidence in the president's public statements of of of, of a very strong interest or curiosity about these issues? Well, that Syria does not appear top of mind. No, I mean, I, I, so I don't. You know, in other words, I you know w when you would expect the president of the United States, uh, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Syria, um, whether it's interference in the American political process, to be articulating. You know, clear, unequivocal views that represent the United States on these geopolitical issues, okay. and we haven't heard them. So, getting you back to pure refugee kinds okay. of questions, one of the question cards. Asked, first of all, the the Genocide Convention. Thank you very much, whoever provided that. In 1948. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I knew it was a long it time. Was, yeah. <laughs> um, it, one of the question questioners asked about Uganda. Uganda has gotten to be known as particularly generous uh, in its response to refugee crises in Africa. It's taken on a lot, uh, particularly from South Sudan, I believe. Um, so, talk to us a little bit about the Ugandan model and what the rest of us can learn from it. Yeah, well, um, this would have been a lot easier uh, answer to offer uh, a month, uh, three weeks ago. But in recent weeks, unfortunately, um, there have been um, troubling reports about um, uh, malfeasance in the um, Uganda, Uganda's um, uh, refugee administration. Mm. And so, but let me put that aside just for the time being, if I could, because I think, you know, for the last. 45 minutes, it's, it's sounded pretty hopeless, hasn't it? Um, and, and I don't want, you know, I, I, I don't think it is. I, I don't think that it is complete. I don't think the situation uh, for uh, refugees and humanitarian and humanitarianism is completely hopeless. I think there are, there are um, opportunities for progress. And what Uganda has done over the past um, a year or two in particular, has been, you know, Uganda has been, and even longer, U Uganda has been a source of um, refuge 
uh, for upwards of a million uh, um, by, you know, by best estimates, uh, South Sudanese refugees who have fled conflict in South Sudan. And um, what is interesting and impressive about the Ugandan experience has been the willingness of the government of Uganda to, um, to give these refugees um, the capacity to have access to education, uh, access to, um, um, to empl employment, mm -hmm. to health care, to be treated, you know, um, uh, with more than a modicum of decency, but more importantly, to be treated as, as individuals who are not simply being warehoused, right? A recognition that if you're a refugee, the traditional model for refugees, and that model is breaking down in so many different ways because the majority of the world's refugees aren't in camps, uh, um, but, but nonetheless, the traditional concept was that these are people who are outside their countries of origin for a uh, limited amount of time, and while they're outside their countries of origin for a limited amount of time, they're given food, uh, they're given the basics to get by, but that's about it for a couple of reasons. Number one, because of the expectation that they're going to go back, but number two, because host governments have not traditionally um, um, wanted to create the impression that these visitors are going to be uh, permanent residents, right? And so the whole concept of, of local integration, and there were three solutions for refugees, repatriation, go back to your country of origin when uh, the circumstances that motivated your flight are, are you know are, are gone where 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 you can go back without being persecuted right so that's one option the second is third country resettlement you go from a place where you've where you where you've uh, got refuge to uh, to a third country like the United States our refugee admissions program right but this but the but the third option of local integration has traditionally also been considered an option that would require the conferral of citizenship. And host governments have been very reluctant on that. It's not. It's not. It's never. It's not that it's never happened, but it's. It's hard to do. Um, the govern. So, but increasingly, um, in the discussions around refugee issues, um, it, it, you may remember in September of nineteen of two thousand sixteen, President Obama hosted a refugee summit alongside a UN summit on refugees and migration, and they came out with a document. And the document talked about the importance of providing. Um, uh, 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 education opportunities, work opportunities for refugees, and um, and they and and uh, they stopped short. There hasn't been a lot of discussion about whether they would be granted citizenship, but the feeling was that this was going a very long way in the notion that that you can build human capital and give people opportunities. The World Bank has gotten involved. See, this is the good news story, right? The World Bank has gotten involved. Um, they're providing assistance. And um, and and the UN the UN High Commission for Refugees has adopted uh, you know has has identified some pilot countries to try to provide these these opportunities for refugees and um, and and we see in places like Turkey where 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 they've lowered the cost of work permits and they provided oppor certain opportunities for refugees to work in places like Jordan where they're where they're having you know uh, discussions with the World Bank and programs for 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 employment and and Uganda um, and so and and the Uganda the the Uganda case is a very interesting one and offers I think you know some hope for um, if you accept the fact that refu some refugees are never going to go back. And if they're never going to go back and they're not going to be resettled in third countries, then they're half, they can't be warehoused. You can't lose generations of people as, as, as um, you know, and, 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 and you have to give people opportunities to build human capital, right? And, um, and, and so that's, so, so, so your question about Uganda sort of opened the floodgates of that kind of, of an answer and approach. And, and this is one of the areas, this is one of the areas of, of I wouldn't say a, in a very dismal situation, this is one of the the, the, the hopeful signs, I think. Right. I believe your Org Refugees International advocated um, uh, to have Turkey uh, give accreditation to Syrian doctors so that they could meet the need of, of the migrants. We've done a lot of well. reporting on Turkey, uh, in ter and one of the critical issues is professional accreditation and we it's a it's an issue here in the United States yeah. uh, for refugees and it's an issue everywhere and um, and, it, and it is addressed in 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 uh, in these global compacts There's one global compact 
on, on migration, and there's another global contract on refugees. I can't remember which one is addressed. I think in the migration compact, the issue is addressed, and the world has to do better on these issues, yeah. but absolutely. And Jordan was looking at, I, I don't know whether they acted on this, but I know King Abdullah was looking at the question of a, a special economic zone. Yeah, they have, they've, um, again, I'm, 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 I'm not completely up to speed on this issue, but, but I believe they have moved forward on those kinds of initiatives, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I guess the real reason that folks are taking, that, that Syrian and other refugees are taking that incredibly dangerous trip to Europe is because they can't earn livelihoods in yeah. the frontline countries and they can't uh, send their yeah. kids to school. No, that, that's, yeah. ex that's exactly right. And this is one of these tricky issues, too, because um, on the one hand, um, I think, you know, there's, there's a considerable sentiment that... that, that um, for a variety of reasons, um, if there are going to be opportunities in countries of refuge for refugees, the bulk of those opportunities will be in areas close to where the refugees live. Mm -hmm. um, and um, on the other hand, uh, some of us believe that uh, you know countries like the United States, uh, European countries, you know, can't. In, a, in addition to providing much greater levels of support for these host governments, right, in Jordan and Turkey, Lebanon especially. Um, but we also have to do a little bit more in terms of, of, of our fair share of, uh, of refugees. And that's why the administration's decision to, um, to uh, announce a ceiling this year of 45,000, it's not, it's not going to get anywhere near that ceiling anyway, uh, has been so discouraging. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of questioners have asked about the relationship between long-term uh, economic development on the one hand and short-term humanitarian relief and how to kind of get out of the silos so that at least when you're pursuing one, it's in a way that's consistent with the other. It's a great question, and I think there is an evolving, there really is an evolving consensus that um, that these silos need to be broken down, that um, that um, and that's why you see, for example, um, the the development uh, uh, institutions that are normally associated with development, like the World Bank, increasingly getting involved in crisis um, response and 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 recovery. In fact, we're hosting a meeting tomorrow at Refugees International where uh, the director of the World Bank's project uh, on this on these issues will be talking to uh, the non-governmental community about the bank's evolving uh, programs in this area. It's very, very important, but you should be aware, I mean, for those of you who are very interested in the field, you should be aware that there are still some um, in the humanitarian community. I, th I don't think they represent um, um, you know, the, the evolving perspective on this issue. But there are still some in the humanitarian community who believe that the, the humanitarian exercise, crisis response, the four principles I referred to, impartiality, neutrality, independence, uh, humanity, that those really are, are separate. And the, 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 the emergency assistance, the life-saving assistance is, is really separate. And when you get involved, and, 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 and those who are involved in that exercise need to stay involved in those that exercise and not sort of uh, get out of their silo. And the reason for that is, one of the reasons for that is that when you, when you get into development, when you get into um, um, uh, uh, the development issues, you inevitably enter the realm of politics. And, and, um, and, and that puts at, at risk some of these principles. Now, um, that, for example, I, th I you know, believe was the perspective of Medsans Frontier when they decided not to be to be part of a of a world humanitarian summit that took place, I believe, in March, March or May of 2016. I think part of their concern. I don't, I don't want to speak for them. I guess I am speaking for them, but I don't want to. Um, it was 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 that was that 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 that, 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 that the you know, that the integrity of the humanitarian exercise was somehow being compromised. So, so I didn't give you the short answer to the question, but, 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 but in short, I think the evolving perspective is that these silos do need to be broken down. And part of the reason they do is because, you know, m most refugee situations are, n are no longer this 
quick onset emergency. They're protracted situations. Right. And when you have protracted situations, you need development. So it's not, it's not a question of whether that's wrong. It's a question, I think, more of who should be doing what. So y y you made reference to this, is it 46,000 or 45,000 yeah, 45. uh, person, person cap? And, and this questioner, his name is Dave, and he said he's got personal experience and anecdotal data that says refugees make strong community members uh, and, and as immigrants for a, for a variety of reasons. I know we had a fellow dean, <laughs> because Eric used to be a dean, uh, uh, the, the dean of the Fletcher School, Admiral Stravitas, said uh, when he spoke here, he said, you know, you know that that guy or that woman who swam across you know, dangerous waters and fought to get into another country and to save his family and save his neighbors, I want that guy on my team. Um, you know, that these are remarkable human beings who've shown courage and determination. And in fact, there hasn't been any evidence of any of, of refugees coming to this country being involved in terrorist acts. So, you know, is Dave right that uh, these are folks who add very clearly to our community rather than detract? Well, oh, there, you know, there's, uh, it's not, it's not simply anecdotal evidence. I mean, um, and, um, and I'm going to sort of go beyond my brief and talk about immigration as well. I mean, um, all of the sober analysis, all of the sober analysis of these issues leads you to the inevitable conclusion that the United States needs to have generous uh, uh, policies of refugee resettlement and immigration. Um, and, um, uh, and, and for so many different reasons. And also leads you to the conclusion that some of the, re not some of the rhetoric, most of the anti-refugee and anti-immigration rhetoric is, 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 is born of no analysis and just nonsense. I mean, uh, let me ask you a question. The, 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 um, the, um, the, 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 tr the, Trump, uh, the, the Trump administration has said that we need to, you know, dramatically enhance security uh, screening processes for uh, refugees because this is such a threat. And, um, and, um, and, and, um, uh, and, and, and as a result, have, have, have enhanced procedures in a way, in, in, increased procedures in a way that basically is clogging the system uh, you know, in, in significant and substantial ways. It was already taking 18 months it was before. Already, it was already. So let me ask you a question. You know, guess the number, 100, 200, 500. The number of, since 2001, when we, we've resettled um, uh, uh, nearly a million refugees since 2001, the number of cases in which a resettled refugee has been responsible for an act of terrorism that resulted in the loss of an American life. 50, 100, 150, what's your guess? I'm guessing zero. Zero, zero. Um, you know, and so this is a fact-free fact free discussion that's going on in the, in the, in, the, in 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 you know in policy in policy circles um, but in terms of the the um, you know the, the the benefits to our uh, our country I, I was I was the dean of the of the of the um, of the public policy school at the University of Minnesota we issued a, a very carefully written report that made the case that unless the state of Minnesota, and which is not unlike many other states, and I realize this isn't refugees, this is immigration, but unless the state of, uh, of Minnesota dramatically, dramatically increased uh, immigration from, um, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, 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 in the next decade, then, you know, economic growth would be imperiled uh, in the state for a, for a broad variety of reasons, mainly having to do with, you know, um, uh, 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 population not keeping up. Um, it, it, the, the evidence just, I mean, uh, David Beer of the Cato Institute, a conservative libertarian think tank, <laughs> they did a, David, uh, either he or a colleague uh, published a report saying that, that um, you know, that, that the incidence of crime among um, not illegal and illegal, both, and separately, uh, immigrants in Texas was far lower than the incidence of crime of 
of, of native-born Texans. So I think the answer is clear. We have to deport the native-born Texans. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, and so it's just, it's just evident. By the way, anyone who's listening, I don't mean that seriously. I'm not <laughs> endorsing deportation. You, you just of want extreme born. vetting. Uh, yeah. It's just extreme vetting. So I mean. But but the the evidence the, evi the, the it's not simply anecdotal on, uh, in, in in these issues and and that's what's a real concern for me that that um, that so much of the policy discussion coming from um, the administration is just it's just void of facts it's and, and void of careful analysis and um, and and essentially it, it comes down to if if you know if um, if 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 of all the immigrants, of, or if all the refugees we resettle come into the United, you know, of, of all the, the millions that, uh, the, the, the million that we've resettled since 9-11, if one person, if one of those, um, you know, is, is responsible for an act, you know, that does violence to an American citizen, that's one too many, and therefore we can't have any come in. That, that is a standard which is just, you know, is patently ridiculous. And if it were a standard that we would use in any other aspect of life, we wouldn't be doing anything. And, and so it's, it's, it is, it, this is the most troubling element of the policy discussion for me. Now, one of the questioners has, has asked about Oxfam at, at this moment of a Me Too movement. And for those in the audience who might not know, there is, uh, it turns out that the Belgian leader of, of Oxfam's deployment in Haiti had uh, employed um, prostitutes. What do you, I mean, at, at this moment when we are perhaps more attuned to this set of, of issues because of the Me Too movement. How damaging is this for Oxfam? How damaging is it for the humanitarian uh, community as a whole? Well, I think it's, it, is, it is devastating for Oxfam, uh, especially as it, Oxfam, for those of you who don't know Oxfam, and, I, and we're in San Francisco, I'm sure you all know Oxfam, right? It's a wonderful right? organization. Um, uh, it's a wonderful organization, which, um, you know, which, uh, um, uh, you know, um, and so I think it is devastating for Oxfam. Um, I think it has very, it has serious and negative implications for the humanitarian community generally. I think the irony, one of the ironies of this situation is, as I understand it, part of the reason why, you know, um, this has, uh, this has come out in the way it has is because of Ox Oxfam's own commitment, uh, to accountability, uh, to, um, you know, to, uh, uh, and, 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 and so if you're committed to accountability and if you're committed not to s sweep things under the rug, right. Right. then the likelihood is that, you know, you're this, it will become public and you're going to get, you, you know, you're well, going to get... They've you, released a big report yeah, on it. Yeah. yeah, you're going to get a lot of, you're going to get a lot of um, uh, 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 grief for it. But, you know, um, and, and that's the price you pay for being a responsible organization. Uh, you know, I don't know... Uh, you, the question you asked me was a simple one. Is it going to be damaging to Oxfam? The answer is yes. Um, I think, um, but I also, you know, I, I admire the organization for uh, being prepared to stand up and say, we did this, this happened, it was wrong, and we'll take measures to try to make sure it doesn't happen it again. It may be another way to have a conversation also about how people act under that kind of stress and pressure. I'm not. I'm not excusing it. I'm. Saying, but we we know about uh, UN peacekeepers. Uh, some pretty appalling stories around there. Sort of how how do you uh, address the fact that under those uh, those conditions you get behavior that is not acceptable? Let me take you to the next questioner since well, you've just sighed. But but <laughs> but I do want to say something about this. That's a hard question to answer because I think. The peacekeeping and sexual exploitation and abuse, and and the and the use of power in that way, is somehow is um, not that the, not that this fellow in Oxfam didn't didn't you know wasn't on, uh, probably guilty of the same thing. But it, this is a we we can talk about that. But 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 the the issue I wanted to to address is the issue of accountability of of accountability of, uh, within the humanitarian community. Um, this is an issue that. Um, you know that the that that the that the humanitarian community, the community of humanitarian aid providers, has been you know consumed by over 
the, uh, the past many years, um, and they've developed standards, the so-called SPHERE standards, um, the, um, the Humanitarian Accountability Project. There are whole ranges. There's, a, there, there's an active discussion among within the non-governmental community about accountability. And accountability is tough because what does it mean? It means it means responsibility. Who are you going to be? Re you know, it, it means to whom are you responsible? <laughs> um, is it your stakeholders? Is it is it is it beneficiaries? Is it your donors? To whom? Who? And for what are you accountable? In other words, what is your product supposed to be? And if and if you don't um, and if you don't behave the way you think you should be you should be behaving, or or if you're not producing or performing the way you should be performing, um, what happens? What kind of what kind of measures can be taken? But I oh, so, and this is a, this is a, a, a you know a long conversation, but suffice to say that. That this is an issue that that, that that organizations like Oxfam have spent a lot of time on. Right. Um, I want to ask you to join me in thanking Eric Schwartz for his remarks. Thank you.